Deportation to Cayenne, he answered. He seemed to think that somebody had given the plot away. As he was keeping watch in the back street, bag in hand, he was set upon by the police. These imbeciles had knocked him down without noticing what he had in his hand. He wondered how the bomb failed to explode as he fell, but it didn't explode. I tried to tell my story in court, he continued. The president was amused. There were in the audience some idiots who laughed. I expressed the hope that some of his companions had been caught too. He shuddered slightly before he told me that there were two. Simon, called also Biscuit, the middle-aged fitter who spoke to him in the street, and a fellow of the name of Mafili, one of the sympathetic strangers who had applauded his sentiments and consoled his humanitarian sorrows when he got drunk in the cafe. Yes, he went on with an effort. I had the advantage of their company over there on St. Joseph's Island, among some eighty or ninety other convicts. We were all classed as dangerous. St. John's Island is the prettiest of the Illes de Salut. It is rocky and green, with shallow ravines, bushes, thickets, groves of mango trees, and many feathery palms. Six warders, armed with revolvers and carbines, are in charge of the convicts kept there. An eight-oared galley keeps up the communication in the daytime, across a channel a quarter of a mile wide, with the Ile Royale, where there is a military post. She makes the first trip at six in the morning. At four in the afternoon, her service is over, and she is then hauled up into a little dock on the Ile Royale, and a sentry put over her and a few smaller boats. From that time till next morning, the island of St. Joseph remains cut off from the rest of the world, with the warders patrolling in turn the path from the warders' house to the convict huts, and a multitude of sharks patrolling the waters all around. Under these circumstances, the convicts planned a mutiny. Such a thing had never been known in the penitentiary's history before, but their plan was not without some possibility of success. The warders were to be taken by surprise and murdered during the night. Their arms would enable the convicts to shoot down the people in the galley as she came alongside in the morning. The galley, once in their possession, other boats were to be captured, and the whole company was to row away up the coast. At dusk, the two warders on duty mustered the convicts as usual. Then they proceeded to inspect the huts, to ascertain that everything was in order. In the second they entered, they were set upon and absolutely smothered under numbers of their assailants. The twilight faded rapidly. It was a new moon, and a heavy black squall gathering over the coast increased the profound darkness of the night. The convicts assembled in the open space, deliberating upon the next step to be taken, argued amongst themselves in low voices. You took part in all this, I asked? No, I knew what was going to be done, of course, but why should I kill these warders? I had nothing against them, but I was afraid of the others. Whatever happened, I could not escape from them. I sat alone on the stump of a tree with my head in my hands, sick at heart at the thought of a freedom that could be nothing but a mockery to me. Suddenly I was startled to perceive the shape of a man on the path nearby. He stood perfectly still, then his form became effaced in the night. It must have been the chief warder coming to see what had become of his two men. No one noticed him. The convicts kept on quarreling over their plans. The leaders could not get themselves obeyed. The fierce whispering of that dark mass of men was very horrible. At last they divided into two parties and moved off. When they had passed me, I rose weary and hopeless. The path to the water's house was dark and silent, but on each side the bushes rustled slightly. Presently I saw a faint thread of light before me. The chief warder, followed by his three men, was approaching cautiously, but he had failed to close his dark lantern properly. The convicts had seen that faint gleam, too. There was an awful savage yell, 
a turmoil on the dark path, shots fired, blows, groans, and with the sound of smashed bushes, the shouts of the pursuers and the screams of the pursued, the manhunt, the warder hunt, passed by me in the interior of the island. I was alone, and I assure you, monsieur, I was indifferent to everything. After standing still for a while, I walked on along the path till I kicked something hard. I stooped and picked up a warder's revolver. I felt with my fingers that it was loaded in five chambers. In the gusts of wind, I heard the convicts calling to each other far away, and then a roll of thunder would cover the sewing and rustling of the limbs. Suddenly a big light ran across my path very low along the ground, and it showed a woman's skirt with the edge of an apron. I knew that the person who carried it must be the wife of the head warder. They had forgotten all about her, it seems. A shot rang out in the interior of the island, and she cried out to herself as she ran. She passed on. I followed, and presently I saw her again. She was pulling at the cord of the big bell, which hangs at the end of the landing pier. With one hand, and with the other, she was swinging the heavy lantern to and fro. This is the agreed signal for the Ile Royale should assistance be required at night. The wind carried the sound away from our island, and the light she swung was hidden on the shore side by the few trees that grow near the warder's house. I came up quite close to her from behind. She went on without stopping, without looking aside, as though she had been all alone on the island. A brave woman, monsieur. I put the revolver inside the breast of my blouse and waited. A flash of lightning and a clap of thunder destroyed both the sound and the light of the signal for an instant. But she never faltered, pulling at the cord and swinging the lantern as regularly as a machine. She was a comely woman of thirty, no more. I thought to myself, all that's no good on a night like this. And I made up my mind that if a body of my fellow convicts came down to the pier, which was sure to happen soon, I would shoot her through the head before I shot myself. I knew the comrades well. This idea of mine gave me quite an interest in life, monsieur, and at once, instead of remaining stupidly exposed on the pier, I retreated a little way and crouched behind a bush. I did not intend to let myself be pounced upon unawares and be prevented, perhaps, from rendering a supreme service to at least one human creature before I died myself. But we must believe the signal was seen, for the galley from Ile Royale came over in an astonishingly short time. The woman kept right on till the light of her lantern flashed upon the officer in command and the bayonets of the soldiers in the boat. Then she sat down and began to cry. She didn't need me any more. I did not budge. Some soldiers were only in their shirt sleeves, others without boots, just as the call to arms had found them. They passed by my bush at the double. The galley had been sent away for more, and the woman sat all alone crying at the end of the pier, with a lantern standing on the ground near her. Then suddenly I saw in the light at the end of the pier the red pantaloons of two more men. I was overcome with astonishment. They, too, started off at a run. Their necks flapped unbuttoned, and they were bareheaded. One of them panted out to the other, straight on, straight on. Where on earth did they spring from, I wondered. Slowly I walked down the short pier. I saw the woman's form shaken by sobs and heard her moaning more and more distinctly. Oh, my man, my poor man, my poor man. I stole on quietly. She could neither hear nor see anything. She had thrown her apron over her head and was rocking herself to and fro in her grief. But I remarked a small boat fastened to the end of the pier. Those two men, they look like officers, must have come in it. After being too late, I suppose, for the galley. It is incredible that they should have thus broken the regulations from a sense of duty, and it was a stupid thing to do. I could not believe my eyes in the very moment I was stepping into that boat. I pulled along the shore slowly. A black cloud hung over the Ile de Salut. 
I heard firing. I heard shouts. Another hunt had begun, the convict hunt. The oars were too long to pull comfortably. I managed them with difficulty, though the boat herself was light. But when I got round to the other side of the island, the squall broke in rain and wind. I was unable to make head against it. I let the boat drift ashore and secured her. I knew the spot. There was a tumble-down old hovel standing near the water. Cowering in there, I heard, through the noises of the wind and the falling downpour, some people tearing through the bushes. They came out on the strand. Soldiers, perhaps, a flash of lightning threw everything near me into violent relief, two convicts, and directly an amazed voice exclaimed, It's a miracle. It was the voice of Simon, otherwise Biscuit. And another voice growled, What's a miracle? Why, there's a boat lying here. You must be mad, Simon. But there is, after all, a boat. They seemed awed into complete silence. The other man was Moffily. He spoke again cautiously. It is fastened up. There must be somebody here. I spoke to them from within the hovel. I am here. They came in then, and soon gave me to understand that the boat was theirs, not mine. There are two of us, said Moffily, against you alone. I got out into the open to keep clear of them for fear of getting a treacherous blow on the head. I could have shot them both where they stood, but I said nothing. I kept down the laughter rising in my throat. I made myself very humble and begged to be allowed to go. They consulted in low tones about my fate. While with my hand on the revolver in the bosom of my blouse, I had their lives in my power. I let them live. I meant them to pull that boat. I represented to them with abject humility that I understood the management of a boat and that being three to pull, we could get a rest in turns. That decided them at last. It was time. A little more and I would have gone into screaming fits at the drollness of it. At this point, his excitement broke out. He jumped off the bench and gesticulated. The great shadows of his arms darted over roof and walls, made the shed appear too small to contain his agitation. I deny nothing, he burst out. I was elated, Monsieur. I tasted a sort of felicity. But I kept very quiet. I took my turns at pulling all through the night. We made for the open sea, putting our trust in a passing ship. It was a foolhardy action. I persuaded them to it. When the sun rose, the immensity of water was calm, and the Ile de Salut appeared only like dark specks from the top of each swell. I was steering then. Mafili was pulling bow, let out an oath, and said we must rest. The time to laugh had come at last, and I took my fill of it, I can tell you. I held my sides and rolled in my seat. They had such startled faces. What's got into him, the animal, cries Moffily. And Simon, who is nearest to me, says over his shoulder to him, Devil take me if I don't think he's gone mad. Then I produce the revolver. Ah, in a moment they both got the stoniest eyes you can imagine. <laughs> they were frightened, but they pulled. Oh yes, they pulled all day, sometimes looking wild and sometimes looking faint. I lost nothing of it because... I had to keep my eyes on them all the time, or else crack. They would have been on top of me in a second. I rested my revolver, hand on my knee, all ready and steered with the other. Their faces began to blister. Sky and sea seemed on fire round us, and the sea steamed in the sun. The boat made a sizzling sound as she went through the water. Sometimes Motfully foamed at the mouth, and sometimes he groaned. But he pulled. He dared not stop. His eyes became bloodshot all over, and he had bitten his lower lip to pieces. Simon was as hoarse as a crow. Comrade, he begins. There are no comrades here. I am your patron. Patron, then, he says. In the name of humanity, let us rest. I let them. There was a little rainwater washing about the bottom of the boat. I permitted them to snatch some of it in the hollow of their palms. But as I gave the command and route, I caught them exchanging significant glances. They thought I would have to go to sleep sometime. Aha! But I did not want to go to sleep. 
I was more awake than ever. It is they who went to sleep as they pulled, tumbling off the thwarts, head over heels suddenly, one after another. I let them lie. All the stars were out. It was a quiet world. The sun rose. Another day. They pulled badly. Their eyes rolled about and their tongues hung out. In the middle of the forenoon, Malfoy croaks out, Let us make a rush at him, Simon. I would just as soon be shot at once as to die of thirst, hunger, and fatigue at the oar. But while he spoke, he pulled, and Simon kept on pulling, too. It made me smile. Ah, they loved their life, these two, in this evil world of theirs, just as I used to love my life, too, before they spoiled it for me with their phrases. I let them go on to the point of exhaustion, and only then I pointed at the sails of a ship on the horizon. Aha, you should have seen them revive and buckle to their work, for I kept them at it to pull right across that ship's path. They were changed. The sort of pity I had felt for them left me. They looked more like themselves every minute. They looked at me with the glances I remembered so well. They were happy. They smiled. Well, says Simon, the energy of that youngster has saved our lives. If he hadn't made us, we could never have pulled so far out into the track of ships. Comrade, I forgive you. I admire you. And Moffley growls from forward. We owe you a famous debt of gratitude, comrade. You are cut out for a chief. Comrade, monsieur, ah, what a good word. And they, such men as these two, had made it accursed. I looked at them. I remembered their lies, their promises, their menaces, and all my days of misery. Why could they not have left me alone after I came out of prison? I looked at them and thought while they lived I could never be free, never, neither I nor others like me with warm hearts and weak heads, for I know I have not a strong head, monsieur. A black rage came upon me, the rage of extreme intoxication but not against the injustice of society. Oh, no. I must be free, I cried furiously. Viva la liberté, yells that ruffian Mafali. Death to the bourgeoisie who sends us to Cayenne. They shall soon know that we are free. The sky, the sea, the whole horizon seemed to turn red, blood red, all around the boat. My temples were beating so loud that I wondered they did not hear. How is it that they did not? How is it they did not understand? I heard Simon ask, Have we not pulled far enough out now? Yes, far enough, I said. I was sorry for him. It was the other I hated. He hauled in his oar with a loud sigh, and as he was raising his hand to wipe his forehead with the air of a man who has done his work, I pulled the trigger of my revolver and shot him like this off the knee, right through the heart. He tumbled down with his head hanging over the side of the boat. I did not give him a second glance. The other cried out piercingly. Only one shriek of horror, then all was still. He slipped off the thwart onto his knees and raised his clasped hands before his face in an attitude of supplication. Mercy, he whispered faintly. Mercy for me, comrade. Ah, comrade, I said in a low tone. Yes, comrade, of course. Well then, shout, Viva la Anarchy. He flung up his arms, his face up to the sky, and his mouth wide open in a great yell of despair. Viva la Anarchy! Viva! He collapsed all in a heap with a bullet through his head. I flung them both overboard. I threw away the revolver, too. Then I sat down quietly. I was free at last. At last. I did not even look towards the ship. I did not care. Indeed, I think I must have gone to sleep, because all of a sudden there were shouts, and I found the ship almost on top of me. They hauled me on board and secured the boat astern. They were all blacks, except the captain, who was a mulatto. He alone knew a few words of French. I could not find out where they were going, nor who they were. They gave me something to eat every day but I did not like the way they used to discuss me in their language. Perhaps they were deliberating about throwing me overboard in order to keep possession of the boat. How do I know? As we were passing this island, I asked whether it was inhabited. 
I understood from the mulatto that there was a house on it, a farm I fancied they meant, so I asked them to put me ashore on the beach and keep the boat for their trouble. This, I imagine, was just what they wanted, the rest you know. After pronouncing these words, he lost suddenly all control of himself. He paced to and fro rapidly, till at last he broke into a run. His arms went like a windmill, and his ejaculations became very much like raving. The burden of them was that he denied nothing, nothing. I could only let him go on, and sat out of his way, repeating, Calm down, calm down, at intervals, till his agitation exhausted itself. I must confess, too, that I remained there long after he had crawled under his mosquito net. He had entreated me not to leave him. So, as one sits up with a nervous child, I sat up with him, in the name of humanity, till he fell asleep. On the whole, my idea is that he was much more of an anarchist than he confessed to me or to himself, and that the special features of his case apart, he was very much like many other anarchists. Warm, heart, and weak head. That is the word of the riddle, and it is a fact that the bitterest contradictions and the deadliest conflicts of the world are carried on in every individual breast, capable of feeling and passion. From personal inquiry, I can vouch that the story of the convict mutiny was in every particular as stated by him. When I got back to Horta from Cayenne and saw the anarchist again, he did not look well. He was more worn, still more frail, and very livid indeed under the grimy smudges of his calling. Evidently the meat of the company's main herd, in its unconcentrated form, did not agree with him at all. It was on the pontoon in Horta that we met and I tried to induce him to leave the launch moored where she was and to follow me to Europe there and then. It would have been delightful to think of the excellent manager's surprise and disgust at the poor fellow's escape, but he refused with unconquerable obstinacy. Surely you don't mean to live always here, I cried. He shook his head. I shall die here, he said, then added moodily, away from them. Sometimes I think of him, lying open-eyed on his horseman's gear in the low shed full of tools and scraps of iron, the anarchist slave of the Maranon estate, waiting with resignation for that sleep which fled from him, as he used to say, in such an unaccountable manner.